I hope everybody was pleased with both speeches, that of Professor Megan Bowler and Mr. Morozov. Now it's time for the debate called the post-truth threat to democracy, how to deal with the new media landscape. In the next hour, four panelists, media experts, will try to answer and discuss questions like, what competences, tools, and initiatives do we need? How can we best teach a critical approach to the media? What should our vision be for the future of media literacy? and uh, how do we promote good journalism and develop new technologies to safeguard democracy and citizenship. I'd like to invite our remaining panelists on stage here with us today are along with already presented Professor Bowler and Mr. Morozov, Mr. Jordi Torrent, who was a media educator consultant for the Department of Education of New York City, developing media literacy programs for students, educators, and parents. He was also the director overseas conversations, a series of international conferences is in New York City focusing on youth, media, and education. Since 2007, he is a project manager of media and information literacy initiatives at the United Nations Alliance of Civilization. And Mr. Aidan White, who is a founder of the Ethical Journalism Network, which brings together more than 60 groups of journalists, editors, and media owners worldwide committed to the fight for ethics, good governance, and self-regulation in journalism. For almost 50 years, he has worked with journalists and media leaders to strengthen journalism, to improve the safety of media staff, and to defend social and professional rights in the media. For half of that time, he was General Secretary of the International Federation of Journalists. Our panelist, uh, Mrs. Martina Chapman, has sent her apologies that she will not be able to come, but instead, Mrs. Chapman, who is an independent consultant specializing in media literacy and digital engagement, media policy and research, has recorded her answers and uh, we will play them during the debate. Thank you for your time and interest. To take uh, into account both presentations, I would like to suggest an example for all the panelists to comment on. Have you heard of the blue whale? Of course, not of it as an animal. Yeah, yeah. Um, for all those who have not, here is the story. In the age of social media, it's common to hear about challenges online that many people are involved in to prove something. And now there's a new one and it's raising concerns. As ABC 7's Jacqueline Matter shows us, some school districts are now warning parents about what's called the blue whale challenge. Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. It's a problem many parents are being warned about as the so-called blue whale challenge makes its way across the United States. And it's a game your team might be playing. It's a 50-day challenge, and students are given different tasks to do, um, with the last task encouraging them to kill themselves, commit suicide. That online virtual game asks participants to complete a wide range of tasks, ranging from watching a horror movie to carving a whale into their forearm and even urging players to jump off a bridge. To win the challenge, suicide is the final task. One Sarasota parent says she's had a recent run-in with a similar but less deadly game her son was playing. I noticed he was in multiplayer mode and he was playing with somebody we don't know. And so I stopped him. I said, we cannot have this app because it's playing with people we don't know. So I think even little things that seem innocent, we have to keep track of them. Kathy Haugen, coordinator of student services in Manatee County, says the game hasn't made its way into Manatee County schools, but it is rumored to have been introduced to two schools in Alabama prompting educators to warn parents about their child's social media use. You should know their password, you should check you know, what type of sites they visited in their 
um, search histories. You should be able to um, monitor all kinds of things on their text messages. It's unclear who was behind that challenge, but there was an app available in the Apple Store and Google Play Store. And social media platforms are now taking notice. If you try to look up the blue whale challenge on Instagram, this is the notification you'll see, asking how they can help and prompting you to a suicide hotline. But you can still find a wide range of posts on Twitter about the deadly game with plenty of photos to accompany it. But Haugen says there are symptoms you should keep an eye out for. Changes in activities, eating patterns, sleeping patterns, people they hang out with if they change friends or if they become increasingly socially isolated. This new app isn't the only thing encouraging your child to take their life. Haugen says recent shows like 13 Reasons Why are adding to the glorification and increase of suicide she's seen over the past decade. Suicide is the number two cause of death in students age 10 to 24. Um, but that said, it's also the number one preventable cause of death. Preventable with a simple conversation something both Haugen and Priestley say can make all the difference. As we're seeing, it could be a matter of life and death. Please let someone know. Don't just let it go. In Bradenton, Jacqueline Matter, ABC 7, your Suncoast News. Well, uh, could you help us uh, determine uh, if this example is fake news, disinformation, propaganda, manipulation? I think it's important. Uh, for us to discuss this case because, um, you know, uh, it's uh, difficult to dissect uh, all the information and uh, separate uh, uh, them, um, fact from opinion news, from fake news, uh, information from disinformation. What, what would you say? Professor Bowler or... Well, I mean, I, I, I get, is it working? Yeah. yeah um, it is. You know, I've spent a decade trying to deflate certain exceptionalist claims about how the internet is different from everything that came before. Mm -hmm. You know, in the 80s, while well, I was still a kid, I nonetheless know <laughs> that there were mm -hmm. a lot of concerns that Walkman is going to result in Satanist cults taking over youth. I mean, it's not what you saw here, I think, is better described as the influence of a cult to a sect of sorts, and it's that kind of behavior that, of course, now you can see propagating through online and digital channels does not mean that it didn't propagate in a somewhat less effective manner through actual face-to-face -face networks before. Mm -hmm. I do not necessarily see it as an expression of post-truth of any kind in the sense that cults and sects and the urges for the young people to commit suicide is not really a recent phenomenon of mm -hmm, the last five or mm -hmm. ten years. It's been around with us mm -hmm. for centuries, mm -hmm. already, but maybe I'm wrong. Professor Bowler, what would you say? Yes, I, I would uh, agree um, with my, my colleague. I, I don't see it as post-truth, but it does seem that it's an opportunity to think about what you were asking me earlier, which is what are the ways that education, mm -hmm. not just media education, but what is the role of thinking about emotion and affect in education? And why is it that it's such a foreign, we don't even always have a vocabulary for it. So in schools, we find that uh, perhaps there's a school psychologist or a counselor where this takes place, but it doesn't happen systematically in the schools. And mm -hmm. I think it is a question, I've worked in teacher education, why do we not have questions around emotion and learning kind of emotional vocabulary, emotional literacy, within teacher education, it's, um, I could say a lot about it. I, I have wondered for many, for a couple of decades now, why there is not attention to emotion in education. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to say that UK Safer Internet Center proclaimed that the blue whale story is sensational fake news. I mean, I don't see how it, I mean, I'm sorry, I, I don't see how it's fake news. It's certainly antisocial. It's certainly entirely manipulative. It's certainly... It is a manipulation. It is, it is a manipulation of emotions. It deals with the fragility and vulnerability of young people in a way which is particularly threatening to society. It's absolutely something which should be dealt with. But to put it under the heading of post-truth, uh, it, it seems to me to be a 
fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of, of, of what it is and what it represents. It also d uh, detracts uh, proper attention that needs to be given to what we mean by the distortions of information which actually lead us to question rational, well-established, consensus-based facts about the world in which we live. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think to mix it up with this it is, uh, it, it is quite inappropriate. Um, and that's why I didn't feel necessary to intervene immediately about this because I don't I think this is this is way off topic it's sensationalist it's cultist it's it's unhealthy it needs to be dealt with but I think it needs to be dealt with in a way which uh, separates it out and recognizes it for the threat it poses particularly to young people and mm -hmm. young vulnerable people mm -hmm. thank you yeah well um this makes me think, actually, of some of the work of research that uh, people like Natasha Dahl Schultz doing, that she's recognizing what she calls ludic loops. It's the ad addiction mm -hmm. that uh, is designed as part of social media. So the social media is designed um, more and more close to the, the, the addiction to game and to gaming, but now it's applied to social media and social media platforms. Mm -hmm. So I see this as, as part of these ludic loops, that she calls it, uh, so that the kind of appealing towards. The other thing that I also thought about is that, um, um, you know, there's another study that was done some years ago uh, in 2013, where uh, they were asking people to stay in a room alone with no uh, gadgets whatsoever, no media whatsoever, and h for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then just left alone with their thoughts and their ideas. And um, if they wanted to kind of uh, do something, they could uh, inflict to themselves a small electroshock. So uh, according to that study by Timothy Wilson in 2013, 67% of men prefer to uh, in, uh, uh, increase themselves with an electroshock than to be left alone in a room by themselves. Mm -hmm. So this idea of like really, you know, and actually interesting thing is like 67% 67 of men and 25% of women. That's an interesting, I don't know what, what conclusions we can take out of that and uh, how uh, scientific that study was. Mm -hmm. But uh, and what, what I'm trying to say is that people cannot be left alone mm -hmm. and just by themselves and their thoughts. So this idea of this ludic loops and this kind of addiction, uh, um, so that, this makes me think of those, those themes. Thank you. Uh, did you know that uh, uh, we had a fake news factory here in our region, in Macedonia? in the city of Wales, well, uh, a teenage boy Boris with his friends produced fake news. He was the main producer of fake news in Donald Trump campaign from Macedonia. Um, uh, Boris had found the article somewhere online and he needed to feed his website daily interesting things. So he appropriated uh, the text down to its uh, last misbegotten comma. He posted uh, the link on Facebook, seeding it within uh, various groups devoted to American politics. And to his uh, astonishment, uh, it was shared around 800 times. That month, February 2016, Boris made more than 150 of the Google ads on his website. And then he decided not to go to high school anymore. <laughs> the question is, um, what Veles produced? Look, I mean, I mean it, 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 that's a great story. Um, and it's an interesting story. And, and it actually is a natural product of the business model that's been created by the platforms that we've been hearing about. Yeah. The fact of the matter is, Boris is an entrepreneurial uh, young man with uh, tremendous skills that anywhere else in the business world would be applauded for his ingenuity, his capacity to sort of take advantage of the business opportunities that are there. Unfortunately. Uh, and well, unfortunately or not, this is the opportunity that's there. And if you're young and uh, enthusiastic and informed and you're in Macedonia and your uh, uh, job uh, opportunities are limited, yeah. you know, good luck to them if they can do it. That, the, the reality of it is, uh, what we see is here a very, very good example of a failure to recognize the sort of distinctions between information which is value-based and information which generates money. 
And unfortunately, as you were pointing out in your uh, uh, statement, the platforms that are providing us with the, the pipelines that allow us to communicate this information do not make any distinction at all between the quality of information that's available. It may come from academic sources, it may come from journalistic sources, mm -hmm. it may come from public inter information sources, or it may come from hate speech centers, or it may come from extremist uh, terrorist groups, or it may come from young men trying to make a living in difficult circumstances in Macedonia. The problem about it is when you move into an age where there is no distinction where between quality of information and so on, then we move into a very dangerous time. And then we have a real problem because we have the emergence of a cold war between the truth and disinformation. And that's what we're living through now. And the question is, uh, how do we help to distinguish the truth? How do we help to create some sort of sense of balance in how not only how we receive information, but how we disseminate information? Because we're all part of that process now. And how, we do, how do we do it on a, value, uh, on, on a basis of some understanding of values? I think that's why one of the reasons why I think this conference is important and the last two days have been very interesting, which I've taken part in. I see that. And I agree with you absolutely. We shouldn't compartmentalize ourselves. We, this is a time for taking ourselves out of our boxes and putting ourselves together to, to address this problem. But I think that journalism and ethical journalism in particular has an enormously important role to play in creating the information environment which will help people, particularly young people, better understand the need to be aware of the consequences of what they create and what they disseminate on, online. And that, would help them to better understand that when they're engaging in, in this process that they are uh, causing disruptive problems. The difficulty is, is that we haven't even got the major platforms that are providing the, the, the mechanism for this information to be transported to actually even accept that they have a public and social responsibility themselves to make a distinction between what is information which is in the public interest and valuable and information which they can just make money out of by in encouraging clicks and more advertising. Mm -hmm. And what about the, the substance of the election? Look, uh, I mean, I think the, the platforms were found out in the election. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg famously said immediately after the Trump election, fake news had nothing to do with it. It was nothing to do with us. Uh, he had to backtrack very, very quickly because the blowback from that sort of claim was overwhelming. Uh, and the information that then emerged showed that actually that there, had, there had been a terribly important influencing of the electoral process through the sort of fake news that, that was generated. And we saw this also, I think, uh, earlier in the, in, in, in the Brexit discussion and so on. And unfortunately, there's a real question mark over the quality of elections now that are taking place in many democratic countries about whether or not they can be subverted easily by these new channels opening up opportunities and taking technical advantages which are now there to try to target people and to direct people towards falsehoods which will get their vote in a certain direction and so on. Now that undermines the quality of our democracy and we have to sort of see where we're being placed as a result of these information changes. So this isn't just an academic reflection about you know, what are the possible consequences for our social, democratic, cultural development as a result of new technologies and so on. The question is really, are we seeing here our democracies being really sacrificed in a process which is seeking to generate new forms of income, a new economy, but at the price of the, perhaps the decay of, of the democracy and the pluralism that we valued for so long. Mr. Morozo, okay. Mm. Well, kind of echoing a little bit and actually about these young men, I, I mean, Zuckerman uh, left uh, hardware. Mm -hmm. Right, he mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's basically the, mm -hmm. at the same level, but in high school instead of Harvard. So yeah. and, and I agree. So in, 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 an, in an, he will be working at Wall Street if he was in New York, yeah. you know. So, but no, I think that probably the bigger bigger issue is that those of us that have been in this field for for many years. Um, over 25 years, um, we see it growing. We see it, uh, you know, more and more conferences like as this one, and more and more research. But what we do not see is to bring these topics and these issues in the school as part of the core curriculum. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we, that's our our occasion right now, is that politicians feel threatened for the first time. 
up to now they did not feel threatened, but now they feel threatened. Mm -hmm. And so now they will hear us when we say, you know, we should bring this, these discussions, these moments of, of reflection in the school and be part of the school curriculum. And what's happening is that the, the trend has been towards STEM, so you know, science, engineering, mathematics, and, uh, and economics, but arts and humanities has been pushed aside. So, and, and media and information literacy is part of humanities, it's mm -hmm. part of bringing back these discussions. And what else, what moment do we have? Uh, and what opportunity do we have of having young people, six to eight hours a day, every, you know, uh, whatever, 50 weeks a year, uh, in, a, in a setting that actually we have the time to bring these discussions to the classroom, to discuss, to have these 15 minutes of silence that people do not feel the need to do something and to discuss and, and, uh, and, uh, and basically educate ourselves through um, not only creating critical thinking uh, skills but also uh, facilitating the production of ethical media. Mm -hmm. Uh, and ethical media messages. Mm -hmm. So I think that what we need to do is really convince our policy makers in education that all these discussions have to be, be brought into school as part of the curriculum. Mr. Morozov, do you agree? Sure, on, on the media literacy part, I agree fully, and you know, I'm, I'm not really an expert on it to, to challenge anything that has been said so far, but I would like to come back to the original question about this young mm -hmm. m person in, in Macedonia. I mean, in a sense, the big, political question here is who gets to appropriate and monetize the surplus attention mm -hmm. generated mm -hmm. by the digital networks. Mm -hmm. So in a few occasional cases, those are this young, heroic, entrepreneurial young people in Macedonia, Georgia, or somewhere else. But mm -hmm. they make for great journalism, which you read in the New York Times. In 98%, I would argue, of cases. Those are not these young individuals. Mm -hmm. Those are big, actually, media mm -hmm. who themselves have become dependent on gaming the advertising system by generating provocative headlines, by you know, coming up with lists of to top 10 cutest cats on the internet, which is what more or less generates the surplus attention. So you know, if you really want to kind of shut down the ability of this select few individuals in Macedonia, Georgia, or somewhere else to interfere mm -hmm. in the occasional electoral process, then you need to be prepared that the media are going to lose good quarter, if not more, mm -hmm. of their funding, which they currently kind of generate almost out of thin air by writing provocative headlines and aggregating content produced elsewhere and packaging it in a way that generates attention that they can then monetize to subsidize actual serious journalism. I don't think that that's a sustainable model even for the media themselves. Mm -hmm. And we are kind of careening towards suicide mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. So, and then of course, it's not, it's not so easy to of kind of shut down the bad yeah, apples without destroying the tree. Mm -hmm. We need a new tree <laughs> and yeah, somebody has to fund course. it yeah, exactly. and it cannot be advertising. Exactly. Professor Poller. Yes, uh, I, I want to add to that and, and pose the question, what news sources do we in fact trust? Because when I'm dealing with these kind of questions, sometimes I wonder, well, would I want to go back to the halcyon days where there was one common newspaper that was shared in a particular community and we could at least have a conversation about what we thought of the coverage of that particular newspaper. So the, to me, part of the question is when, what are the moments where we might want to say that a traditional news source is serving as propaganda. I mean, do we want to say that's, you know, all the time? I, I, I don't know that that's accurate, but I think there's some very concerning instances of that, and the reason I showed the irony of the New York Times saying subscribe to reason rather than rhetoric and uh, we have the truth is thinking about instances where, you know, they made an incredible amount of money from covering Trump, and the coverage of Trump versus Clinton, for example, um, there was vastly more coverage of Trump than of Clinton, and the, tr the coverage of Trump was vastly more positive. And so many people have argued that that was a significant reason uh, for a significant factor in the election, not to mention questions about what gets covered. So, for example, 
um, when the emails were discovered um, again by the FBI a week before the election, right? Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. news really went to town, covering that incredibly. And I think, you know, many of us were wondering, well, where was the investigative journalism mm -hmm. about that was known even since July 2016 about Trump's uh, questionable ties to, to Russia. Where was the stories about that? So there are many, many such questions, and I think it does raise the question of when do we want to speak about traditional news as being part of propaganda? Mm -hmm. Well, okay. look, I, I mean, I think <clears throat> using terms like propaganda is, is actually, we have to be careful about this. We just spent two days, two very useful days. I really enjoyed it, enormously rewarding and enriching to talk with a lot of young people who are trying to sort of wrestle with these questions, and I thought it was a really excellent uh, uh, propaganda lab that we had. However, I was concerned about the term propaganda and how we tend to make it a, we make a rather banal sort of uh, definition of propaganda, which tends to sort of suggest that it, uh, any form of bias potentially beneficial or negative bias can be seen as being propaganda. Well, I think that's actually very difficult when you come to this beautiful town. Sarajevo is a great place. I love it. I, I, I used to come here quite regularly. But I used to come here when there was a terrible war going on and had contact with the journalists and so on. And this whole region understands the word propaganda in a very different way. For propaganda is, a, is an instrument for hate, it's an instrument for incitement to violence and ethnic cleansing. And we, you have a crisis in this region within the media and in the information sphere in which you have, for example, the media still fighting a war <clears throat> almost a generation since the guns fell silent in this, this area where the terms for propaganda is, 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 you know, has, has some meaning uh, still. And, and I'm <clears throat> very interested in, in the points that you're making because in a way, both of you have referred to what I would regard as the, the deep crisis that there is in public information provided by journalism. Uh, that, that journalism is being severely weakened. There isn't an economic model that gives journalists the capacity to earn a living from doing good journalism. There's no incentive to do good journalism. There's no in incentive to be balanced, to be fact-based, to seek all sides of a story, to show humanity, not to take sides, to be transparent in what you do and so on. There's no in economic incentive to do that today. So there's a question. If we value that stream of information, which should be ethically based, it should be accurate, it should show her humanity, have impartiality, uh, and, and be independent, at least in some sense, vision. It's a long way away, but it's receding ever further, even with group, as you say, the New York Times and others, as we see the weakening economic model. So the, there's a question. What, who's going to pay for the information that democracy and pluralism needs for the future? Who's going to produce it? My view is mm -hmm. that that therefore means we have, to, we, we, we have to look at this question of media literacy and its contribution to the, the, the well-being of our societies and the creation of a generation, new generation that is aware and able to participate freely in this information landscape. We actually have to look beyond our schools and educational institutions if for a new movement, I would call a social movement, which it it targets also centers of power, centers of political power, centers of commercial power. Uh, the adult world in a way which says, we have to find ways of stopping hate, hate speech. We have mm -hmm. to find ways of being more transparent in our communication. And we have to find ways of encouraging more ethical journalistic transmission of information and so on. Because if we don't do that, then I think that, 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 that there is a danger that we are heading into a very, very uncertain sort of period. So that's one of the issues which I think a conference like this really needs to, to think about, is how do we contribute to building a new social movement which promotes wider public understanding about this sort of crisis that we're in, and I think it is an information crisis, but that goes beyond that crisis as being seen only being visited upon young people. When it comes to propaganda, uh, French President Emmanuel Macron 
speaking at the anniversary of Velde Eve recently uh, said in the context of racism and anti-Semitism that social networks are the great purveyors of such propaganda and we are yet to understand the scope of their influence. Our magistrates and law enforcement agencies must be better trained in this matter. Just if, you, if I may, I mean, I, I, I think that we are all agreeing that there are many different layers and many different points of view of, of the same topic that we are uh, facing and discussing. One obviously is like the economic, uh, the economic uh, system that is providing that. The other one I, I really enjoy when you were mentioning the, the deep stories, you know, like post-truth will not develop if we don't have previously deep stories that we built on mm -hmm. on, on post-truth. Mm -hmm. So those, those, those deep stories, is, is, uh, it's part of, uh, it's kind of like a vicious circle where, where we have our own beliefs and uh, we are not willing to uh, believe something that it's outside of our uh, area and understanding and, and what we believe is the truth. Mm -hmm. And, and that is already, actually, you mentioned Bernays. Bernays, in his book, uh, Propaganda, said very clearly that politicians will not succeed if they don't say what the people already want to hear. Mm -hmm. so, that's the, so you see, it's, like, it's not that... Uh, the, the main problem for me, uh, obviously, is generally and it's societal, but the area that we need to focus, really, is, is in education and in the schools, because there is where we have the opportunity to really discuss that uh, at, at length mm -hmm. and, and, bring, and bring upon all these deep uh, feelings, uh, all these deep understandings, all these things that we take for granted, all these things that we take, this is nature, uh, and kind of like question these concepts at, at, that, at that point. Mm -hmm. Yes, if I may, I, uh, I appreciate what you're saying and I'm, and I'm thinking also about what, what Aidan was saying. I wonder if it's useful to think that propaganda has different um, structures and forms and valences in different contexts. So, of course, there's, uh, we could talk about propaganda that incites violence and is biased in a particular way in this region, uh, given its history as compared to the United States. Um, thinking about those deep stories in the United States, I, could, I think I could make an argument that, um, that the deep stories around gender, around why were there no headlines about we almost had a first female president in the United mm. States. Prior to the election, there was no coverage of that sort. I was watching very closely mm. the, the traditional news. It was not there. So in a way, that deep story about gender and about race, all of these questions, the questions and the ways in which Trump represents a call to make America not great again, but make America white again, uh, that's part of the deep story. So when the New York Times chooses to cover X rather than why chooses to cover Trump rather than Clinton, one could argue that that is a form of propaganda, that it's even if it's simply about making an economic choice, that that is the news that will sell, would we not want to take account of what you've been speaking about in terms of the logics of capitalism and how that functions to create propaganda, particularly in, in a context where, where the currency and the question of, of funding for news is, is, is paramount? Even did they choose to cover Clinton except of Bernie Sanders? So it's even previous to that. It was clearly that you know Bernie Sanders was really, if we look at how much media time Bernie Sanders had as opposed to Clinton, it's clear that the media was, was very not uh, uh, unbiased on that. You know? It was clearly who their games were with. Yes, and there, there's an issue of uh, two-party versus three-party system, and Canada does much better on that score. I just wanted to add that, you know, in my experience, uh, challenging deep stories, especially if those deep stories benefit organized power mm -hmm. within a certain industry, mm -hmm. can be a rather dangerous and expensive proposition. Mm -hmm. I can speak to you from the experience of just observing these giant technology firms, mm -hmm. which are now eating up more or less mm -hmm. the rest of the economy, the amount of critical technology journalism 
that goes beyond the heroic narratives of entrepreneurs in a garage building the next uh, Apple. They're tiny, they almost don't exist, mm -hmm. in part because the technology journalists do not see a future for themselves yeah. that does not somehow already presuppose mm -hmm. that they will end up working for technology industry mm -hmm. 10 or 15 years mm -hmm. down the road, and in the meantime, they'll become its consultants, uh, they'll receive speaking fees for promoting its box events and so forth. I mean, that unfortunately is the nature of technology journalism, which arguably should be in the avant-garde of trying to understand this new uh, model, mm -hmm. and it's not there. Unfortunately, you can make a living by being a technology journalist, but you'll have to in integrate yourself with the industry and continue promoting its deep stories. And I would argue that's probably the same in the financial journalism and many other you know, energy and so forth. Unfortunately, the growing precarity of particular bits, particular bits that are related to industries, makes me question to what extent this problem is solvable just at the level of media literacy and educating mm -hmm, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the readers and the, and the kids. We have to do something about critical journalism with teeth. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Torrent, uh, you are the project manager of media and information literacy initiatives at UNAOC. Fighting propaganda is uh, one of many projects you work on. Uh, has the UN done enough to stop propaganda? Uh, of course. <laughs> In which way? <laughs> Be, more specific. <laughs> Be more specific. The, yeah, I mean, uh, the UN is actually a very big umbrella organization. Under UN, there is UNESCO, who's working yeah. very much mm -hmm. on that. There is also UNICEF is working, UNDP, uh, UNFPA, etc. So there is a, a lot. But the, the UN is also uh, the conglomeration of the of the of the countries of the world that makes the UN mm -hmm. so it's not that we are we 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 are not a, a policy making organization we all what we can do is kind of discuss bring to the table the themes to be discussed and um, and hope that policy makers will pay attention mm -hmm. and, and then will trickle down into actually policies in their own countries. Uh, we're, we, from, we do what we can with the resources that we have. We, just two weeks ago, I actually I had, I organized at the UN uh, uh, a conference on uh, fake news from the perspective of news literacy. And we invited uh, a number of experts on that. And there were some member states at the, in the room hearing that discussion. So hopefully something of that will trickle down. But, uh, you know, the UN is like, uh, the best example of the UN is that uh, the Security Council, you know. So we, mm -hmm. we have there like five countries mm -hmm. and to have them just, this, just these five countries to agree into something is uh, quite often very difficult. Look, I mean, I think <laughs> your and his friends do an awful lot of really good work. And I, I mean, I, I, mean I, 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 know, I know that. And I know there are people deeply committed to it and so on. But. But when we, of course, <laughs> I have to say but. I mean, of course I have to say but. Because actually we're talking here about a massive political crisis, as we've, uh, as we've heard earlier. This isn't just a sort of social educational crisis or a sort of an information crisis for a particular sector like journalism and the media. We're talking about a, 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 a massive political crisis. We see, and all of the evidence points towards it, we heard it earlier, there's falling public con confidence in democratic institutions. People don't trust, there's disenchantment over democracy and its institutions. People don't trust their political leaders mm -hmm. as much anymore. Mm -hmm. They expect to be misled by them. They expect dishonesty. That's part of the, the price that people, people are deeply cynical. And unfortunately, we see now a deeply cynical form of the authoritarian politics beginning to emerge, which is challenging the very fundamental basis of uh, human rights, which uh, we have known and understood in the post-war period, where there has been a settlement on a whole gr agreement about how society should be, how they should be respectful, how they should be, uh, respect the rights of women, the rights of children, that there should be a, whole, a completely new order. We see that being challenged by political leaders. We see them uh, the last few days taking the stage at the United Nations in New York mm -hmm. to declaim you know, their, their positions and so on. And we know that back home, back home, they are interfering with media. They're stopping uh, uh, journalists doing their job. They're, they're, they're dealing with dissent in a hostile manner and so on. They are undermining the fabric of pluralism and so on. They're promoting uh, dangerous, uh, divisive uh, propaganda, and in some cases, real hate, hatred between communities and so on. So, I mean, I, mean, I think 
the, the United Nations has a responsibility, and I agree very much with, with what you when he says, actually, in the end, all that the United Nations institutions and the good people who work within them can actually do is what they're allowed to do by their masters. And unfortunately, the political masters at the UN these days are weak and unfortunately are very weak in, in terms of their defense of our fundamental rights. So I think that uh, uh, we, we should encourage as much as possible this sort of work, but we should recognize we need to do much more work at national level, uh, tackling our po politicians, holding them to account, subjecting them to, to proper scrutiny. Because unless we get some political movement, I don't think we're going to be able to address the fundamental problems that we are discussing here today. There's some more results. No, no, I agree. I mean, I, I, again, I appreciate the, the efforts of, 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 of anybody within the UN framework to do anything about these issues. But again, we have to recognize that at a sort of much longer historical framework, you know, there were efforts in the 70s by the non-aligned movement, of which you know, Yugoslavia was one, to articulate mm -hmm. what they called the New World Information and Communication mm -hmm. Order that would actually make people much less reliant on advertising-driven media, and, and that failed in part because it was opposed by a handful of governments of which the US was one, in part because it was heavily opposed by the media conglomerates themselves. Mm -hmm. So given the failure of those more ambitious structural transformations to actually transform how the global public sphere functions and what kind of logic drives it, yes, at this point we have to rely on the you know, good nature benevolence and some kind of public spiritness of uh, public officials to do something at a somewhat smaller scale, but do nonetheless, I sort of celebrate those efforts. But I don't think that that should prevent us from also trying to articulate at a much higher structural level what the new agenda should be for rebuilding the kind of public, national, municipal infrastructure for data gathering, data ownership. I mean, we have to find a more robust model which does not just end up with four American and four Chinese but firms how to find appropriating. It. How? How no, I mean, I can it? articulate how you do it. I mean, the problem is not articulation. The problem is fighting political support mm -hmm. to actually carve out a different illegal regime for data ownership. Mm -hmm. How do you convince that the data you produce should not just belong to the provider of the service, but should belong maybe to the city where that service is built, or to the municipality, or to the citizen? It requires massive political backing. It requires also at a national level a strategy for how do you build a system for promoting artificial intelligence that's not just in the hands of a few firms, but in the hands also of society and shared more broadly, has local entrepreneurs involved in it, mm -hmm. has, you know, why should a company like Uber be providing transportation services in you know, Bosnia or the Belgium or France or whatever. I mean, there is nothing that makes a California-based company knowledgeable about local transportation markets in many European states. Mm -hmm. It can be done locally, provided we actually have the capacity to encourage local entrepreneurs to get ownership of the data, mm -hmm. to get ownership of the algorithms, to actually build those systems. We can do that, but that would require massive rethink on behalf of our politicians, mm -hmm. and we have to mobilize people to push for it, mm -hmm. not just mobilized by the rhetoric of privacy, which has been the traditional axis around which these campaigns were mobilized in the past, mm -hmm. but also by the agenda of essential economic disparity and inequality that's only going to get worse as more and more values mm -hmm. appropriated by the giant mm -hmm. firms. I mean, their value is not just fictitious, it reflects quite coherent future plans to take over other sectors of the economy. Mm -hmm. You already see with Amazon buying Whole Foods. I mean, it's not, it's not a bubble. Like, we are lucky if it's a bubble and it's just yeah. going to burst and we are going to lose some money, but it's not a bubble and that's what makes me feel very negative about what's coming if we don't really change how mm -hmm. we do things. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because what you're saying reminds me of uh, Nicol Nicolas Negroponte, who's one of mm -hmm. the founders of mm -hmm. uh, the Media Lab at MIT, is, is actually saying exactly this. Uh, in, in a, or maybe not exactly, but close to that. Uh, I would at, blame him, to be honest. <laughs> well, he, he's saying it now. He's saying it now. <laughs> uh, just a few months ago in Paris, he was having that speech, actually. Uh -huh. He was saying that uh, now every, m most of the graduates from uh, um, the Media Lab of MIT are taken by all these big conglomerates, and then very few of them are going out there and doing really innovative work. 
and really a, a, a kind of transformative work that are just basically just continuing growing this bubble. Mm -hmm. And then there is also a big movement and it talks about and it's like we need more Facebooks. The, in the idea that, you know, within the, uh, the television model where there was kind of the national television and that mm -hmm. was the only one and then suddenly mm -hmm. there were other TV networks that came out and etc. So that we are, I think, at that moment mm -hmm. where, we, where we need that. We need that transformational movement. Where the money will come from, I think if there is political will, the money will be there. Okay. Well, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> I mean, if it, if, yeah, I mean, um, look, I mean, I think at a conference like this, I, I, I mean, I, I I mean, I would hope that, that one of the things we could think about is, is think about big picture things. I think that's right. I mean, it's unquestionably the case, and I've been saying this to a few people, that we, we are, we, you know, we are living in a period immediately after uh, an enormous social technological earthquake, which has wrecked all of the buildings in our, in our neighborhood. And we have to rebuild them. But actually, we need new architecture. I mean, radically new architecture. We need, need new forms of what we regard as public information services. We need new mechanisms and streams for funding education in this area, for funding new forms of journalism and so on, new forms of communication. We need a completely changed institutional landscape, which creates the mechanisms. I was having a friendly argument with a colleague just before this conference about, you know, who was saying, oh, look, basically what you were saying to me, as so many people do, you're a complete idealist. You're out of, you know, it's, not, it's just not going to happen. The reality is that journalists and media won't buy this, which is true. I, I absolutely accept that. There's an enormous ideological battle to be won within the industries, within the sectors that we represent. But I think that gets easier if we accept from the beginning that we need a radical substantial change to be put on the agenda that helps us then I think form the new partnerships that we need and I you know one of the things that I find sad and I've come to meetings like this before and I, f I find this wonderful community of media literacy educators are doing fantastic things and I see so few journalists in the room or media representatives in the room the lack of engagement of journalists and media directly in this policy development of this work I think is a great source of regret and so one of the things I hope that we could do is to build new partnerships with media with uh, uh, journalistic organizations to try to carve out these new alliances that I think we do need to start giving some political push. You are our uh, guardian angel for, for uh, all uh, journalists, you know, uh, you, you work with a lot of journalists all around the world. So uh, I would like us to discuss um, uh, journalism today. Uh, I would like to share uh, the story uh, of a colleague of mine who was actually forced to tweet, you know, and uh, she didn't want to do that because she's always in a hurry. And uh, reporting uh, on a Croatian government session, she said, sent some tweets as uh, first information. After that, a number of portals uh, uploaded her tweets. Of course, in a hurry, she made some mistakes. And um, she had misunderstood one piece of crucial information. Most of the media put it on the front page, but it was incorrect. After that experience, uh, she decided not to tweet anymore in her professional career. Mr. White, uh, you've built your entire, I would say, impressive professional career without social networks. How do you see the present situation? I mean, I think that uh, the, the present situation offers fantastic opportunities for much improved communications, the benefits of which we, you know, we've heard about earlier. And I, and I think we're living in a golden age of communications where there is real democratization in the capacity for people to talk to one another and to share information. This is fantastically important. I also am happy to have witnessed in the last 25 years the sweeping away of the a charmed circle of elite professionals in journalism and media who have controlled the information agenda for the public and so on. For me, this democratization process has been enormously important because it opened the door to a new form of engagement between media and audience, which is much more democratic and potentially much more effective. But I think there are obviously drawbacks. I think journalists who think they can tell stories in, in on 
on, tw on Twitter, well, they, m they might be able to sort of share a few jokes and anecdotes, but they're not going to tell a story. Yeah, the fact course. of the matter is, is that, the, that most media organizations are sensibly putting in place guidelines on how to use Twitter and mm. so on. And uh, uh, orga media organizations driven by the imperative of getting as much traffic as possible and clicks for their uh, uh, stories and so on are, are pushing their journalists, driving their journalists across ethical boundaries. Mm -hmm. And that seems to me to be extremely dangerous. Mm -hmm. it's forcing people to make ethical choices which are completely unacceptable and so on. So what has changed? An enormous amount has changed. But what hasn't changed is what drives me. What hasn't changed is, first of all, the public need for reliable, useful information and to receive it on time. And what hasn't changed is the responsibility of journalism as, an, as a public institution to provide through a framework of ethical values public information which is reliable, useful, honest, and in some way truthful. But at least it can be accurate or fact-based in the way that it's generated. Now, that hasn't changed at all. The need for that information to be generated and distributed is still there. The need for people to receive it and have access to it is still there. The tools have changed, the technology has changed, and so on. We just have to find a new way of, of, of ensuring that we give ourselves access to information that we can regard as accurate and truthful and honest and impartial. And we need to nurture the resources, the people who will be able to generate that uh, information. I spend a lot of my time, wonderful time, speaking to audiences, young students, graduate students, about who've just come out of uh, college doing mass communications or journalism, and they're, they're fresh-faced and they're full of energy and enthusiasm, and you sort of think, great, it's very inspiring to be with them. But, but I know that very few of them are going to get real jobs in mm -hmm. journalism, because you can't make a livelihood out of journalism these days. So my worry is that they'll drift off into corporate communications, into political communications, into public PR. relations and so on, that they will be sucked into this awful sort of uh, system that has been generated in which just takes all of the talented people, creams them away from the public sector mm -hmm. and so on. So we have a, a real job to do to try to create visions that will give these young people a future and a future in providing ethically useful information for society as a whole. And I think that's the way that journalism should mm -hmm. be organized. It has been in some parts organized in the past, but you know, I know all that's bad about journalism just as I know as no. much as what's good about journalism. And I, uh, so I, I, I spend my time concentrating and focusing on the best of journalism and promoting the best of journalism, while at the same time trying to expose some of the horrifying things that journalists get up to. You know, there is a great theory of um, uh, also brothers. Uh, they were uh, like um, American columnists, Joseph and Stuart. Uh, they had the theory that a journalist is only good uh, as how many steps he takes in the field every day. That means that you have to go out and see people, talk to them uh, face to face, not face to book. Well, to, well to you, every journalist I know in this room who had the opportunity to leave the office would regard it as a, a breathtaking opportunity, <laughs> meeting the audience, going into the streets, going into the field. Unfortunately, journalism isn't like that these days. Yeah. Unfortunately, sadly, it's uh, many people uh, stuck to their desk, chained to their desk, yeah. generating stories, exactly. googling yeah. stories, you know, checking what they can, but basically meeting a target of five stories Looking or six for stories all a kinds day. Of, of you know, profiles. Absolutely. So I mean, and but this is much less journalism. It's what a friend of mine called churnalism. Uh, it's about churning out information, you know, as quickly as possible to a timetable, and it's not engaging with the audience, it's not engaging mm -hmm. with the people who need to have their voice heard and so on. So, I mean, I, I, I agree. So how do we create more time? How do we create more resources? Uh, all of these are sort of the questions that have to be answered mm -hmm. if we're going to have good journalism. Mm -hmm. What would you say, Mr. Torrent? Well, um, I, uh, obviously I, I agree. I, I'm, I'm not sure it doesn't engage with the audiences. I mean, uh, you know, you're, you, you see how many stories are... It's made. face to face. Ex right, but but the the media, uh, even if it's um, you know on on a ethical questionable uh, ways, 
are, is engaging with people. They, they are retweeting and tweeting and Facebook and et cetera, et cetera. So the stories are out there, maybe are not the stories that we like to hear or we like to see. The stories that, again, are, are deeply set it in, 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 in our already preconceived what's true. Um, but um, there is, you know, probably never in, in mankind has been as many media outlets as now. Mm -hmm. so, so there is, that's the, that's, that's the, the challenging is that, that, that uh, at the same time, there is a big movement, which I think is probably bigger in the United States than in Europe, what's called like the news literacy, which very much engages with uh, schools of journalism, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that is something that it's, it's perhaps another way of bringing media literacy within the news literacy um, interest. So I, um, I think, again, I'm, for me, I, I, keep, I keep saying that we need to change the structure, you know, we need to change society, et cetera. It's obviously, the changes are magnificent, but there is a simple change that we can do, which is the schools. We can change the schools, so we can start there. That's what I'm just saying. Mr. Morozov. Sure, well, the <clears throat> I think the good news about journalism is that much of it will be automated over the next five years or so. Mm -hmm. and you already see it, that you actually have various service providers that just offer you mm -hmm. to take a bit okay. where there is statistics that is repeated on a daily basis, mm -hmm. you know, football scores, weather, mm -hmm. market reports, okay. mm -hmm. and do it automatically. Mm -hmm. You can purchase mm -hmm. that service mm -hmm. and it will mm -hmm. come to you. Uh, that does not mean by any means that journalists will be able to focus on longer investigative stories. Like I don't, I think it's, it's a utopian uh, uh, happy end really? to this story, mm -hmm. which is never going to arrive. Mm -hmm. You're just going to end up with news organizations mm -hmm. that more or less are like Uber and Airbnb. They wouldn't own anything, like Uber does not own any cars and mm -hmm. Airbnb owns no apartments, but they manage to generate a lot of revenue and profit for whoever stands behind the algorithms and the automated platforms that generates all that content. Right? But to reflect on the question you asked about your journalist friend, I mean, look, there are two types of futures for journalists now. One is for, maybe it applies to five, seven percent of the profession. Those are people who have stable jobs, those jobs that will be there for 30 or 40 years, they don't have to tweet. They don't have to tweet because they actually get a paycheck every month and that paycheck will arrive for the next 30 or 40 years. If you don't get a paycheck and you're not sure that that paycheck will still be there in three or four years, you have to build a brand. That's how you essentially make money from journalism over the long term. How do you build a brand? You do it by tweeting and you know, you have no, I can't possibly imagine a young journalist now who would bat on that stable path to employment and not on building the brand. It's a very precarious and risky thing to do, not to be investing in your own brand by mm -hmm. tweeting and always you know, presenting yourself as some kind of opinion maker, pundit, and so forth. Unfortunately, this is what generates the income of many journalists, and that part will even increase the more we automate the actual news gathering process. Mm -hmm. So all you'll be left with are will be pundits who will, you know, will be pontificating because they have a brand and they will reflect on the experiences of riding, you know, taxis in Sarajevo and they will be distilling the wisdom of taxi drivers to the rest of us mm -hmm. by presenting it as opinion piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, I, I don't know if that's dystopian future, but I already see it happening now. It doesn't mm -hmm. seem that futuristic to me, to be honest. Would I mean, like I, to add something? <clears throat> I mean, I mean, I think a little bit of good news might, might be helpful here in, the, in this about journalism. <clears throat> we carried out over the last two years um, an analysis using uh, journalists, expert journalists in around 30 countries, most of them in Europe, about how media cover migration. And I've covered the migration mm. crisis here in Europe. And it's, of course, very interesting to people in this region. And those reports revealed enormous number of problems about media. So media were repeating the hate speech of politicians, media were not giving voice to minorities, media were not, all sorts of actually typical problems which have always been there with media. But one of the things which was really interesting in every single country that uh, was re we were reporting on, there were examples of outstanding journalism, journalism of solidarity and humanity, journalists taking risks, journalists challenging the authorities who wouldn't allow them access to places where migrants were being herded up, journalists who were courageous 
physically as, you know, as well as intellectually in the, in the way that they were challenging things and so on, that prizes were being awarded for, for good journalism and so on. So that with all of the bad stories that we have, we found that even in the worst parts and worst countries where there were political problems and so on, there was tremendously inspirational journalism taking mm. place. And actually, uh, we, we don't say enough about that. We don't know as we say enough about all of the problems and so on, that actually there is a, there's a whole class of journalism being carried out out, which is tremendously important and which gives us some hope that those people who want to have jobs, long-time jobs, and, and, and build brands, that they can build brands around good quality. Mm -hmm. and, and there is inspiration uh, to, be, to, to be taken, even in these really difficult times. Mm -hmm. Professor uh, Bowler, in your speech, uh, you uh, actually made a call to educators to consider the emotional and effective dynamics of uh, new consumptions and social media networks. Um, I dare to say that uh, the new education you su suggest needs time and certain civilization level. Uh, is there any way for helping young people getting there faster? Especially here in, in uh, the region. Maybe I, I can try and address that in relation to what we were just discussing. Um, I think it's very important in our work as uh, adults modeling to young people or as teachers and educators to let people know about the different sources of journalism. Mm -hmm. we, we haven't, we've barely touched on the question of, of public uh, journalism such as uh, the CBC or um, NPR, and these are always struggling for funding in the places that we're, we're speaking of. But I think part of the lobbying, part of the activism, part of the, the utopian vision is to, to in, uh, increase and um, continue to support those. And I know when I was doing the book Digital Media and Democracy, doing interviews with um, really amazing journalists like Amy Goodman of Democracy Now! I mean, there's very few uh, independent, not-for-profit uh, media sources today. But letting people know about those, letting young people know, and just exposing folks to the really different and diverse um, forms of journalism, the kinds of citizen journalism, the kinds of uh, people who were blogging from Iraq, like Dar Jamal. I mean, there's just phenomenal people around the world. So I think it's quite an inspiration. And, and media education, one of the cutting edges that where I saw media education kind of hit, and then I wonder what's next, maybe it will be the emotion and affect question, but was really in, in emphasizing the need to for young people to be part of production, to do production, to do media production or digital storytelling, whatever we might call it, or uh, there's folks who will be talking about that in the conference here. But that allows uh, people to see what is involved in producing a story, that there's always a point of view, um, that the word choice, the et cetera, is, is really crucial. The other thing I noticed when I was looking at how media is moving, YouTube is, even though we've been talking about Facebook as one of the platforms that, that mediates what we see and that people, in fact, pay more attention to who the friend is that's sharing the news than the original source. And that is a very concerning thing. The other thing I was just noticing is, particularly on the right, that there uh, much of that news is coming through YouTube. And I think we need to pay a lot more attention to what those channels are and to educating ourselves um, out of our fil filter bubbles, perhaps, but also educating young people about these different sources. and giving them an opportunity, giving young people an opportunity to, to produce that within their local environment. So in terms of the question you ask, what is this going to look like? What, what will it actually look like? I think there is value in, in even going back to this blue whale example. Uh, what, what does that say to us? In part, it says to me that there is value in developing a vocabulary to even name the emotions and affects that, that we experience in the world. And uh, whether that's individual or collective, why is that not part of teacher education? I mean, this has been a question to me from time immemorial. I don't understand where is this piece in education? Is it that emotion and affect is so difficult to talk about that it's amorphous and we don't know how to talk about mm -hmm. it? Is it that mm -hmm. there's political 
ethical reasons that we don't want people to have that kind of literacy. I think there's many, many reasons. But I, I don't think, uh, I think that we are absolutely creative and intelligent enough to know how to do that. And, and finally, I would want to say on the note of hope that in terms of grassroots movements and that I have witnessed and studied um, over the past years, I feel a great deal of hope in, uh, in the generations that are part of grassroots movements and that right now a lot of that energy is having to be mobilized and the places I'm looking at is having to be mobilized, save um, against uh, the white supremacy, for example. I do hold media responsible, um, some of the media outlets we've been talking about, for how they cover that. And I think that if, if um, there is more thoughtfulness about that coverage, that um, then perhaps grassroots mobilization won't have to attend to some of these issues. So there's a dynamic relationship between movements and, and media. Um, and so I think those are very important uh, dynamics mm -hmm. to attend to. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I would like us to finish with Martina and uh, her answers. Uh, I um, asked her um, uh, what would she say, what is the main problem that the public is facing today? Is it uh, knowledge? Is it the lack of responsibility? Uh, is it the lack of confidence or something else? There are three areas of media literacy that will, I'm sure, will be discussed over the coming days and well into the future. And they're intertwined, and I think critical thinking is fundamental to each of them. And it's around understanding data, it's around understanding um, the commercial factors, so commercial literacy, and also news literacy. Uh, the dependency that we have on online and networked media means that we need to better understand how our data is gathered, by whom, for what purpose, and who will have access to it. And most importantly, perhaps, we need to understand how that data can potentially influence what we see and hear and read online. Personal data is an increasingly valuable commodity. And there are more nuanced um, advertising uh, techniques such as the use of personal data for um, micro-messaging, uh, such as native advertising, or such as celebrity endorsement. And all of these techniques can make it much more difficult for some people to distinguish between fact, opinion, and advertising. And the network world that we live in, combined with our human tendency to seek out people who are like us, perhaps with similar views to us, means that uh, you know, we're potentially placing a lot of trust in information that we get from people like us. And with people increasingly using social media to access their news, um, often re relying on items circulated by friends or friends of friends, how can we be sure that the version of the networked truth that we're getting is actually an accurate version of the truth. Now, in addition to those specific points, there's a couple of more general points I'd like to make on, on, on this question. Uh, the first is, it's about our own ability to recognise gaps in our own knowledge. You know, in real terms, social media hasn't been around that long and it's evolving all the time. So against that constantly moving background of evolving technology and changing social norms, how are we supposed to recognise gaps in our own knowledge? And even if we do, how are we supposed to find the time and the energy uh, to address those gaps in knowledge? Another concern is the highly personalised nature of media literacy needs. People are individuals and how we engage and use uh, the media it can also be really individual. And as a result, people's media literacy needs will naturally differ from person to person. So we, we will probably have to get better at identifying and meeting very specific media literacy needs, very personalised media literacy needs. 
you know, the the the, uh, the old saying of one size fits all, I don't think is uh, is applicable here. And finally, I think perhaps the biggest media literacy challenge that we face is actually ourselves and our own human nature. People form opinions and beliefs for complex reasons and better equipping citizens with the cognitive skills to analyse the content does not necessarily mean that they will do that every single time or that you know cognitive reason will win over moral or socio-emotional factors. Uh, listening to some of the political debates in recent times I, I did wonder whether we as a society uh, we're losing the ability to discuss, to listen, to see the other point of view. Um, and, and I'm concerned that that leaves objectivity in a, in a vulnerable position. Is there anything you would My like to add? To the best or the fastest way to achieve oh. um, <laughs> skills and competencies Sorry. that are crucial for using media content in a responsible way, especially in relation to new media. In the past, our media consumption was, to a large degree, regulated. However, we now live in a different world where we are accessing more content uh, that is not regulated in the ways that we are used to. This can make it more difficult, but also much more important to understand how media works how it's funded, and what the possible motivations of the content producers might be. In March, the European Audiovisual Observatory published uh, an EU-funded study mapping around 500 of the most significant media literacy projects um, across the 28 EU countries. Reassuringly, critical thinking was identified as the most common media literacy skill addressed by these projects. And I think that as use of the internet continues to evolve in ways that we probably can't even imagine right now, uh, those skills of critical analysis and critical understanding will become even more important. But to answer the question, I don't think there is a fast way to achieve the skills and competencies that are so important for using media in a, in a responsible and effective way. Media literacy is a dynamic concept. It evolves in response to technological, to social, cultural and political changes too. It also requires us to be aware of our own biases. And as a result, I think media literacy requires constant updating of skills, of knowledge, and of awareness. So I think it's, it's a lifelong learning journey, and it's often a behaviour change journey. And changing behaviour takes time. It takes insight, and it takes a range of different partners and stakeholders working together to provide support to people at a range of different points on their learning journey. Now we probably all agree that media literacy and in particular critical thinking is the key to empowering people to make the best possible use of the media that they can. However, helping people to develop better, better critical thinking skills will not be a panacea to all of the challenges that digital um, media creates and will create in the future. But it will be a strong first defence, especially if we take a more personalised and a more long term and a more coordinated approach to promoting media literacy. Thank you. Now is the end. <laughs> well, uh, I suppose uh, you all agree with Martina, more or less. Okay, uh, thank you on, on behalf of everyone here. Uh, I would like to thank you for a most interesting uh, debate. And uh, I hope uh, that after that stimulating uh, discussion, you would like to ask 
some questions or maybe a comment on some of points the panelists made. Hi. Thank you so much for that, so much for that uh, great uh, provocative opening. Um, my question is uh, for you, Evgeny, but maybe the other panelists have some ideas about this. I've been thinking about how maybe you're inviting us, maybe you are inviting us to expand media literacy education in order that uh, learners of all ages better understand the economic and political value of their clicks. Maybe you're inviting us to expand media literacy to better understand how classifying platforms as media might enable regulation that would balance freedom with responsibility. Maybe you're inviting us to think about um, how um, imagining a future beyond the market-based platform dominance that concerns you, um, maybe that could be addressed by having citizens who are reflective, self-conscious, and aware of, their, of how their participation maintains the status quo. You didn't, in your talk, uh, urge us to change the way we do media literacy. But I wonder if you think there might be value to um, applying principles of political advocacy to what, to the more or less safe approach that we've used in trying to bring media literacy into the traditional contexts of school and schooling. What do you think? Thank you for your question. Should I respond? Or? Yeah, of uh, course. No, I thought maybe it'll take more. Um, first of all, I have to apologize. I have a plane at one, so I'll answer, but I'll have to slowly drift off stage, otherwise <laughs> I, I will not be able to make it. But, uh, you know, I'm not arrogant enough to come to a gathering of media literacy professionals and scholars and tell you guys what you need to do. Like, I don't operate like that. I think the conclusions you have drawn uh, are logical and reasonable ones. Um, I do think, though, that here we get into a very contentious and somewhat blurry territory where we do not really know whether we are talking about economic literacy here or about media one. And I don't know even if we have to make that distinction, but ultimately I think the, the fundamental problem that we have now with all of these digital platforms is that have, we have a very poor grasp of how value is produced in this digital economy. We don't know whether we are the ones producing it, or whether it's the companies that are producing it, or whether it's big data and the algorithms that are producing it. And we don't really have a clear chain of how that value is produced and generated. And I think that in the absence of that clear chain and clear framework, it would be very hard for us to encourage people to kind of better understand what is actually going on. And it's not just a problem of not educating people. It's that even at the level of theoretical analysis, we don't really have a good grasp of how value is produced. And here I'm reflecting more on the theorists and sociologists of the digital kind of network sphere and not just on the media literacy scholars. Right, so we really need to understand, so if we assume that these companies give us a subsidy of $20,000 per year because we use those services for free, are we the beneficiaries or are we the losers? Are we generating more value for them than $20,000 that they give to us as a subsidy? In which case, you know, if they're generating more value, then they're more or less profiting from us, or are we generating less value? In which case, they actually are the kind of parallel privatized welfare state that we should be celebrating and constructing. Right? So I would encourage, of course, media scholars to ask those questions and to push the conversation forward. But I know enough about the sphere of economics and you know, sociology of these networks to tell you that we don't have a good grasp of how value is produced. Of course, I do think that the introducing these fundamental questions, not just about the economics, but also about the structural effects of the digital transformation and digitization is paramount. 
Like you really have to understand how expertise will be affected by it, how the political life will be affected by it. I don't think that we can actually believe that given all of these communication tools and platforms that we have, you can assume that political parties will continue functioning the way they have functioned traditionally with centralized hierarchical structure and not a more decentralized networked one. A lot of things will change, right? So I think the only way to educate young people and anybody else interested in the consequences of this digitization is again to pose this question holistically and not to shy away from areas that have traditionally lied outside uh, of media literacy and the media sphere as such. And I think building bridges to economics, to sociology, to political science of some kind would be extremely useful. But I think those bridges have to be built. And I do think that you know, we're living through a time where this question of value in digital sphere has to be posed explicitly and it has to be answered because otherwise we will in a way will be consuming propaganda given to us by those firms that you know, they're working for us and it's not us working for them. Yes, so why? Yeah, I mean, I, I, can I just add to that? I mean, I, I agree with that completely. So, I mean, I think there is a need for a revision of thinking about media literacy and, and what is being taught and so on. Um, I mean, I, I think we have to recognize that, that that question of how we classify platforms, for instance, classifying those media so that they take responsibility for what is published, that uh, there is recognition of public interests, it, it values, is very important. Look, I, I mean, it seems to me educators and journalists and others in, uh, in public life have to start talking about what the consequences are of these changes in a wider, in a wider context. Because if we, if we don't, we won't be actually providing input into a debate which governments are already responding to. We're seeing governments already beginning to draft and put in place measures to try to control these platforms and so on. And there's a lot of controversy about all. For instance, what's happening in Germany about the question of the takedown time in the Britain. We heard from Theresa May just a, a few days ago in, the, in New York. She's thinking, they're thinking of introducing a two-hour demand, a uh, two-hour demand on platforms to take down material which might, might be giving succor to or support to terrorists or, uh, and, and, and so on. I mean, I mean the, the, these are real uh, are things that are likely to be happening. So we see the recognition of the crisis at the political level, and it seems to me absurd for, you know, for, for journalists and for educators not to recognize that there's something going on here that we have to stimulate in the, in, 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 in the minds of the people that we're responsible for, a discussion about what are the consequences of what's coming up and how do we manage it, and manage it in a way which will protect our freedoms, but at the same time allow us a degree of control over these new platforms. I mean, I think one of the interesting things we've we've always relied on the past and if you look historically at um how would I describe it? When capitalism gets out of control. If you look historically at it, governments have intervened when companies have got too big, too powerful. Even in the United States, the home of free market capitalism and so on, there's a long and actually proud history of intervening to break up conglomerates when they get too big, too powerful, and beyond the control of the public sphere. And, and I think, I mean, we're, we're moving into the space where that is clearly now becoming the case with some of these platforms. So um, should we be making this part of our discussion and understanding about the changes taking place? Absolutely, I think it's essential. Yeah, I, I think that these discussions have always been part of media literacy. When we were discussing, when before the internet, when we were doing media literacy on television, uh, we already were discussing all the economic factors of television, television programming, advertising, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So basically, what we're proposing is just expanding that kind of discussions to what media literacy has already been doing from the beginning. There's always been the discussion of what are the economic context of television programming. Mm -hmm. Professor Bowen. I just wanted to add uh, that in terms of understanding the value, if you have anything to say about the fact that researchers are still waiting for Facebook to allow us to look behind and understand uh, what's happening. We have open, and there's open API with Twitter, so scholars are quite easily able to study how things move there, but we do not have that opportunity with Facebook. And um, some of us are trying to ask that, and uh, so far the answer is that they are not ready to do that. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, again, a lot of those firms would not want to open up their data because it will immediately rupture those deep stories on which they have built their public case. You know, so a company like Airbnb, 
would not want to tell you that the primary beneficiaries of Airbnb in a city like Barcelona are actually investors buying real estate in Barcelona and not the individuals whom middle classes whom Airbnb claims to support and represent. So they have a stake in not disclosing that data because you'll see that the stories that they tell us can actually be quite erroneous and false. And I celebrate the work of many researchers and data scientists who've built tools and platforms to scrap the data from those websites so you can get at least some understanding of what it is that those firms are hiding. Right? And I would encourage actually more work and funding to go towards those issues so even if those firms refuse, we have an alternative window on what's happening because a lot of the data that they do generate, they have to publicize themselves because it lies at the core of the model, like in the case of Airbnb. Unless they show you where the apartments are, you wouldn't know that they're available. So that data is available, we can grab it, but we need the resources to do that. Yeah. And I really, sorry, I really have to go. I, I would love to stay more, but we're 20 minutes behind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again. Uh, before I invite you for a coffee break, I would like to inform you that a uh, networking session will start in 15 minutes in the hall. And the important thing is that you can bring your coffee with you. And now we can go for a coffee break. Thank you, thank you.